Congressman Ron Paul was in New Hampshire on Tuesday for CNN's Republican presidential debate. That morning, he was the guest on The Exchange, a New Hampshire public radio program hosted by Laura Canoy. From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Laura Canoy, and this is The Exchange. Inside the Beltway, they call our guest today, Ron Paul, Dr. No. Paul is a Republican congressman from Texas and now a GOP presidential candidate. He got his nickname from his record in Congress, voting against many issues he feels violate the U.S. Constitution. That's why he voted no on the original Iraq War Authorization, no on the USA Patriot Act, and no to trade agreements like NAFTA. These votes match up with Paul's libertarian philosophy, which extends to his personal life as well. For example, he doesn't participate in the congressional pension system. When his children reached college, age, he said no to federally subsidized student loans. As a medical doctor, Paul didn't take part in the government-run Medicare or Medicaid programs, instead offering discounts or free care to his poorest clients. Actions like these and his record in Congress have long endeared Paul to libertarians, and he was their party's presidential nominee back in 1988. But Paul is not a purist. On the social issues where many libertarians have a live-free-or-die philosophy, the congressman is more in line with conservative Republicans on matters of abortion, immigration, and gay rights. It's a unique combination that's winning him attention among conservative pundits, if not yet many voters. A recent Fox News columnist opined that Paul may be the only real Republican running for president. Tonight, Congressman Paul will try to convince New Hampshire Republicans that, indeed, that is true, as he joins nine others in the GOP debate at St. Anselm College. This morning, the Congressman joins us in the Exchange Studios. We'll take your calls to 1-800-892-6477, one 800 Eight nine two N H P R and Congressman Ron Paul. It's nice to meet you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Real nice to be here. Well, the most basic question first, Congressman: Why are you running for president? Well, I I run to win. That's the purpose of running. But uh, I am introducing a rather radical idea, and that is that I think we should always obey the Constitution. You know, that's something that I think we have forgotten in Washington, both the executive branch, the judicial branch, as well as the uh, legislative branch, and. If we ignore the Constitution, then there's no rule of law, it's rule of men. And I think that's where we've gotten to today, and that's why the government's out of control, and we go to war without declarations, and the wars never end, the spending never slows up. And, and I think our country is uh, slipping away, and, and certainly the Republican Party has slipped away from its conservative uh, traditions, and uh, I think there needs to be a change, and I'm offering that change. Can you elaborate a little bit, Congressman? And you gave me some examples, but um, every member of Congress would say, well, yes, I'm sworn into office, promising to uphold the Constitution, and that's what I'm doing. So how are they not adhering to those you know, constitutional and, principles? And I think a lot of them really believe they, uh, they are. They just interpret it differently, you know, conveniently so. You know, they might take the Interstate Commerce Clause and misconstrue it and say, well, I can regulate anything and everything, uh, and not looking at the history of it and the original intent, uh, where it was originally intended to make sure that there's trade between the states and you could travel between the states and uh, trade barriers were broken down. But uh, the modern interpretation is we can regulate everything and anything that goes between the states, and that's not the uh, proper interpretation. Also, the General Welfare Clause is, uh, you know, general conditions of the country should benefit all of us equally, you know, like freedom and sound money and these different issues. It doesn't mean that it endorses the welfare state because that's specific welfare, welfare for the rich, welfare for bankers, welfare for the military-industrial complex, welfare for foreigners through foreign aid, and yet they sincerely believe because they've been taught this way. So I think it's a reflection of our educational system over many, many decades that we have uh, now a generation or two of people that have gone to Washington that really don't quite understand the limitation of government power. Our Constitution was written to limit the power and the size of government, and yet government is very big and very powerful, and Washington controls about everything that we do. How do you feel, Congressman Paul, about the argument that the framers were brilliant in writing this Constitution, making it flexible and open to interpretation so that it could adapt to modern needs? I mean, certainly our country is mm -hmm. vastly different 
and more complicated than it was uh, back when it first got started? Well, it, it's both a, uh, a good idea, but a very dangerous one. It's, it's good in the sense that they have provided a way to alter the Constitution. That's amend it. And they want to do it slowly and deliberately, and uh, so the, the change can be made and adapt to modern times. But just to say it deserves reinterpretation uh, willy-nilly means there's nothing left, and so we don't have the rule of law, and I think that's where we are today. They said, well, we live in different times. That's sort of like arguing the Bill of Rights no longer applies because we live in modern times. I think privacy was very important, and I think the Declaration of War was an important issue. I think the First Amendment is a very important issue, Second Amendment. But those kind of things don't change just because we live uh, in modern times. They're, they're very, very important. But if we want to change them, we have to do it deliberately, or we have no rule of law. And that, to me, is a tragedy. And I think this constitutional issue will come up as we continue our conversation this hour when it comes to foreign policy and domestic right. policy. So I'm going to leave it aside for the moment. But I want to pick up on something you said uh, a bit ago. You said, I'm running to win. Congressman Paul, you don't need me to tell you this. Even among your admirers, there's doubt you can win. Uh, a very flattering Fox News columnist said, you're a not terribly powerful congressman who is a pariah in his own party, which also happens to be the minority party, not the ideal presidential dossier. Now, I'm quoting there again from a very flattering column. How do you respond to that, that you really are in this to shape the positions of the field, but not really to well, win? Well, the answer is, is nobody knows the future. Nobody knows what will come, come of the campaign. Uh, we're doing much better than I ever dreamed we would already. So I, I would say that if we continue on the upswing, uh, things could uh, uh, continue to improve after each debate. We have uh, generated a lot of activity and a lot of interest, a lot of fundraising. So I, I don't know uh, where these people get this uh, great wisdom where they know exactly what's going to come out in the future. But I also understand reality and I understand long odds. And quite frankly, I never thought I'd go to Congress, uh, you know, because uh, I thought people would wouldn't respond to this message. But the message is a powerful message, and the people are starved for it, and they're ready for it, and, and they're responding already to it. So we don't know. All kinds of conditions could change between now and the real election, the real polling uh, next year. I mean, the war could be worse. The financial situa situation could be much worse. We could have a financial crisis, and they might be looking for somebody that has some answers. You in Congress have so often been uh, that doctor no. You know, one of your colleagues said, if every member has voted against it except one, I know that, you know, that was probably wrong. If you're so often in the minority in Congress, and how can you convince a majority of Americans to agree with you? Well, if, if your colleagues aren't even buying it. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good point, but I think Washington is about two or three or four years behind the people. People are way ahead uh, of, the, of Washington. Just think about the war issue. The people want the war ended, and this is what they're voting for, and they're disgusted with Democrats and Republicans right now. And uh, so there's uh, every reason to believe that the people are much closer to my positions of limited government and uh, getting out of foreign entanglements and bringing our troops home. Uh, so just because Washington is not in step with me or the people doesn't mean they're right. Uh, the rightness comes from, you, you know, analysis and understanding and what the people want and looking to the Constitution. And uh, I feel very comfortable with the positions I take. And a moment ago, you mentioned that you were pleased with the way that you're doing so far in this presidential race. And I do want to mention that a very recent uh, ABC News poll puts you right in the middle of the pack of 10, um, above Tom Tancredo, Tommy Thompson, Duncan Hunter, Sam Brownback, and Jim Gilmore. So you're not at the rock bottom anyway. See, we're moving up. Our phone number here in the exchange is 1-800-892-6477. And today in the exchange, we're talking with Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul. He's a Texas congressman, a one-time libertarian candidate for president back in 1988. He's also a medical doctor, the father of five, grandfather of 17.